that's I can't see many much many of the videos. So have you guys uh, yourself hide the videos or something technical to share? You can turn on the videos on if you're comfortable and do that so that I can see everyone is attending. Not everyone is asleep while I'm talking. All right, it's uh, 10 past nine, so I'm gonna start. All right, um, first of all, welcome to all of you who are going to attend my session today for the CAPS operation the summer, camp, summer exam. Uh, the purpose of this session, I'm doing it for the first time just to tell you the last minute uh, uh, tips and tricks to you guys to how to attend the exam and uh, topics you need to cover just before one week of the exam and what topic if you are uh, if you forget to um, read or study any topics so how can you cover those topics i'm gonna summarize the whole caps uh, in just one hour or 45 minutes or one hour i will try my best to do that so i want you guys to write down uh, everything which i'm gonna discuss here uh, the things which i'm gonna discuss here everything is important so if you are, uh, yeah, so guys, if you guys, uh, if you are missing with something or if you, if you forget to study something uh, from the medications, which I'm gonna discuss with you now, just try to uh, write down the name of those medications and uh, study about them. Those, those medications, those things, those points will definitely, definitely come in the exam um, in one way or the other. All right. So uh, everything is important. I have summarized the whole CAP syllabus in these uh, 25 slides. All right. Um, all right. So three more people are coming in. So. All right, so this is the first slide. Um, all right, so basically the whole CAPS uh, uh, exam consists of uh, two papers, uh, as you guys know that, paper one and paper two. Uh, paper one consists of pharmacology and pharmaceutical chemistry, as you guys know that. Uh, paper two consists of uh, pharmaceutics and uh, therapeutics, all right? So technically, uh, they put pharmacology in paper one and they put uh, therapeutics in paper two. Uh, the reason being they want to test your detailed knowledge about the medications from these two subjects. Uh, most of the people who pass paper one, they unfortunately end up failing the paper two exam. And most of the people, the percentage of failing the exam is more in paper two as compared to paper one, just because they don't cover the therapeutics portion. Okay, so if you can't hear me, just uh, uh, pinch me on, okay? So again, uh, All right, so technically uh, we have to cover both pharmacology uh, and therapeutics portion in order to pass the exam. So that's why they, uh, with the proper reason, they put pharmacology and the therapeutics in two separate papers. Uh, to be honest, the key components for the whole exam would be the pharmacology and therapeutics that would make up 70% of the course, uh, which you have gone through already uh, through some resources or any other resources and pharmaceutical chemistry and pharmaceutics makes up 30 percent of your course. So, uh, if you are spending, for example, 24 hours a day uh, on study, so you should spend 70 percent of your time on doing pharmacology and therapy. So, I ask this is 21st of November, so 6th of December until 6th of December, you should be spending more than 70 percent of your time on doing pharmacology and therapy. And the things which I'm going to tell you about the pharmaceutical chemistry and pharmaceutics would be more than enough to cover. All right, so just spend more time on the pharmacology and therapeutics. Uh, 
that will uh, make you pass the exam. All right, paper one from ecology and chemistry. First of all, I will start with these. Uh, this subject this is uh, quite a basic thing. You know that pharmacology that consists of an indication and mechanism of action. Mostly in paper one, they ask about the simple and straightforward questions. They will ask about the uh, drugs use. What is the use of uh, panadol? What is the use of uh, uh, ibuprofen? What is the use of methotrexate? And what's the indication? And what is could be the mechanism of action? Uh, usually, I have seen, as per my experience, they usually ask about the uh, mechanism of action for very very common medications. For example, from uh, at the, Loop diuretics or ACE inhibitors or ARBs. They usually ask these kind of questions from uh, uh, from the pharmacology portion. Basically, they ask about the basic indication. They want to check your knowledge about the basic use of the medication. So you should know the basic knowledge. Make it clear, CAF is a test of your basic knowledge. They will not ask you in depth or in detail question. Uh, more than 80 percent. Uh, questions could be spread forward. Yes, they can trick you on 20 percent question. So, from the pharmacology portion, just do the, uh, the simple indication, the use of a medication, and try to memorize the uh, mechanism of action. That will cover the whole pharmacology. That's all. Uh, regarding the chemistry portion, uh, chemistry. So, to be honest, if you want to try to do the detailed SAR, if you want to try a detailed functional group study, if you want to try to memorize all the structures, uh, being a human being, that will be a bit impossible, uh, to be honest. So uh, that's why I summarize the chemistry into three components. It is chemistry, SAR, and structures. Uh, uh, um, um, people who got the resources from me, they know that what I'm talking about. So basically, uh, 70% questions from the chemistry portion, they ask about the stereochemistry. They will ask about the energy mass, they will ask about the uh, possible mirror images, they can ask about the orientation of the molecule, they will ask about uh, the position of the different functional groups, they can ask about the structures. Usually, these kind of questions are very common um, from the chemistry part. Right? So I, I will discuss in detail. Uh, Next one, paper two consists of pharmaceutics and uh, therapeutics portion. So you know that pharmaceutics is pretty much simple. So you don't need to spend too much time on it. One week or one and a half week will be more than enough to cover the pharmaceutics portion. Uh, as I have mentioned, the basic things you should know the dosage form. So dosage forms consist of tablets, capsules, um, cap uh, tablet capsules, ointments, emulsions, and all these are things uh, are basically uh, involved in the pharmaceutical portion. Similarly, dissolution tests, uh, the use of a dissolution test, the use of a disintegration test for purpose, we can say preservative agents in the eye drops, very, very important along with the percentage. So you should know uh, all of these things. Uh, these are very important. So if you want to cover the pharmaceutical, 100% pharmaceutical, chapter number two of the CPR will be more, more than enough. That chapter contains in detail knowledge of the emulsifying agent, suspending agent. We usually ask if the following is an emulsifying agent, if the following is a suspending agent, or they can ask about which is the charge on a uh, suspending agent, which is the charge on an emulsifying agent. For example, usually they ask the charge on acacia, tagacanth, anionic, non anionic, cation. So you should be aware of these things. They can ask you these questions from you. And of course, uh, preservative agents, so you should know that what percentage and which preservative is present in the eye drops, especially eye drops, because the use of preservative agents are very common in the uh, in the eye drops or the ear drops, you can say. So, uh, if you have covered pharmaceutics from somewhere else, that's good, but you have to cover at least these specific things. So you should cover all the dosage forms, you should know the difference between immersion and suspension, you should know the size of the suspending agent, you should know the size. Uh, of the particle in the suspension. You should know the consistency differences between the emulsions and the suspension. You should know what are the different types of emulsion bases. So, anyone knows about the different types of emulsion bases? Anyone here who can? Anyone? Types of emulsion bases? 
emulsion bases absorption bases uh, yeah uh, what are the types of the emulsion bases it's like the yeah it's like a benzene cream cold cream and these are all the emulsion uh, yeah bases bull fat right? bull fat and hydrous fat or something yeah so uh, to be honest, so these are the emulsion bases last time i think uh, in the october exam they asked about the uh, cold cream so what is the type of the cold cream so if the cream comes in our mind we talk about uh, it's a cream it's different from the form but that's not the thing cold cream is uh, basically in water and oil or oil and water emulsion you can check it out so these are the things which you should be aware of so the summary of the pharmaceutical is to uh, clear clarify your concept about the different dosage forms their particle sizes uh, their purpose for example uh, i'm going to discuss in detail in the next few slides but these are the basic points which you should cover from the first i will discuss in detail in the next all right now here comes a technical part here comes a difficult part uh this is a bit tricky this is a bit uh, frustrating part which uh, most of the students have uh, have a complaint about right so this is a therapeutic exposure most of the students who feel difficult is just because of a therapeutic exposure uh i always tell of my students that there are many groups going on which says that uh, if you have done the first 13 chapter of cpr if you do if you study a uh, lipan court you going to pass exam so the news is you cannot pass exam by just doing these uh, picks about the first 13 chapter of cpr and the lipan court you don't have to pass exam technically you are a pharmacist if you study the lipan court you will only study the pharmacology right so you are covering the pharmacology portion from the lipan court if you study the uh, first 13 chapter of cpr uh the cpr consists of first 30 chapter consists of pharmaceutics and a bit of chemistry in that right so there is no therapeutics written in the first 30 chapter of cpr so that's why most of the students who try to follow that formula they end up running the paper too just because they completely avoid the therapeutic portion so as i told you pharmacology consists of an indication or the tools you can say or and the mechanism of action that's basic pharmacology Whereas therapeutics consist of these things, which I have, which you can see on your screen: the doses, interactions, precautions, monitoring points, adverse effects, and calculations. Now, if you go through the Australian Pharmacy Council website, you will see a hell amount of topics from from this particular subject. So I'm just going to discuss those topics. Which at least you should cover to pass the exam. The mantra is: you don't bother about the 50 wrong ones. 50 wrong answer you are have to bother about 50 right answer right for those 50 right answers we have to study it selectively and smartly so if you do these things this will make you pass your therapeutic portion super easily this is a bit technical the first thing part but believe me if you do this part uh, in a more competent way you will be able to pass it now how come they ask how they ask the doses and how come you memorize the doses that's a good question actually the problem with the doses is if you go through the cpr or if you go through the amh if you go to any other book they have different doses for example uh, there are plenty of doses and uh, they they have given you the ranges of the doses for example uh, take an example of ibuprofen the dose of ibuprofen is 200 to 400 mg every 4 hours right that's a basic dose usually in exam they will ask you the appropriate dose right so appropriate dose or they ask about the maximum dose right because they are checking your basic knowledge once you sit in the routine exam and the oral exam after your internship then they will ask you the range of the doses at this point they will ask you the maximum doses mostly so if you do the maximum dose automatically you can you can answer in a way you can answer uh, in a in a way of ranges of the doses as well so try to memorize the maximum doses of the medication that will give you an idea about the ranges number 1 number 
most commonly they ask about the doses from the hypertension chapters or the CNS chapters or you know, they ask about ask from um, thyroid chapters, all right? So for example, ACE inhibitors, they have a six to seven medications there. So you should know the range of the doses of all the medications. Mostly are between 25 to 100 milligrams. So that would be the range and then you can do the maximum doses of the individual medications. So that's the way of memorizing the doses. Believe me, if you memorize the doses properly, that question will be straightforward, right? And you will not be spending more than five or six seconds on attempting that question. It means you are going to save time in the rest of the 99 questions. So, uh, what, how, what I suggest to memorize the doses, I will make my own list of all the doses and I put it on my, uh, uh, in, in my room on the wall so that I can memorize um, by during cooking or during something else, during watching TV, I just memorize the doses, just checking. Even uh, I try to go to the pharmacy and see uh, what are the different uh, medications over there and what are the doses mentioned on the pack. So that will help you to memorize the doses. Uh, I understand this is not a time of doing these things, but yeah, yeah, if you are revising the thing, you can do this. Now, interactions. We will not ask about the like uh, very, very usual interactions. They always ask the unique interactions. For example, we know that tetracyclines have an interaction with milk. We know that warfarin have an interaction with uh, any blood thinners. We know that uh, amoxicillin have an interaction with allergic people. We know that, uh, so always try to point out the unique interaction or unique point from the interaction heading uh, the book you are following, right? But just, just do those things. I'm going to discuss, the, uh, I will tell you the name of the common medications from which they usually ask these type of questions. Okay? Now the monitoring points. What are the monitoring points? Monitoring points are those, for example, uh, the person is taking two diuretics. So what diuretics is causing? You should know the mechanism of action from the pharmacology. Diuretics is basically uh, like removing the fluid out of the body, right? So you should be aware of monitoring the electrolyte. You should, be, you should monitor the sodium level, potassium level, and calcium level. These are the things, this is the time in which you connect your information. You connect your CVS from the CNS. You connect your CNS with the GIT. You connect your GIT with the pharmaceutics. So this is a point of connecting your knowledge. So the, uh, like if you able to connect the knowledge in the exam, you will be able to pass exam. So that's, and it comes into the category of monitoring points. Uh, or uh, an adverse effects, of course, uh, any medication, Who's causing an, um, uh, side effects? You should, for example, low diuretics, they uh, increase the fluid excretion. So you should know that they might cause the uh, uh, hyponatremia and the, and the hypocalcemia and hypokalemia. These kind of things are side effects. Very common side effects. For example, tetracyclines are famous for causing what? Tooth discoloration. This is a very, very common question in exam. So you should be aware of these kind of interactions. So, uh, warfarin always changes the INR of uh, INR of warfarin, so uh, aspirin changes that. So I'm going to discuss in detail about what is INR and why they ask these questions in exam. So they ask these questions. Then calculations. I'll discuss calculations later in the slides. These are the important things. If you don't cover these points, you will not be able to pass the exam easily. So uh, in the last few days, last 10 or 11 days, spend more time on doing these things. Now, come start with the pharmaceutical. This is the first subject. Uh, so I will start with this one. This is the easiest one. It will take only five to six, five, six days, and then you will be all right with this, with this specific subject. So uh, dosage forms. You should know the tablet. You should know the types of tablet. You should know uh, the purpose of tablet, dispersible tablets, uh, enteric coated tablets, um, thin coated tablets, the purpose of enteric coated tablets. This is a very commonly asked question in exam. He was not asked how we do the enteric coating. He was not asked how we do the sugar coating. He was asked what is the purpose of the sugar coating or the film coating or the enteric coating. Right? Uh, I remember they asked about questions from the capsule. They asked about the questions from the sizes of the capsule. What are the different sizes of the capsule? What are the soft gelatin capsules? So uh, uh, memorize these things. Similarly, ointments, emulsion. So you should know the ointment. You should know these kind of things, how you uh, uh, how are you going to uh, answer these questions from the exam? Next point is the colligative property. If you study the chapter number two of the CPR, they are mentioned a colligative property. So 
qualitative property, the lowering of the melting point, elevation of a boiling point, lowering of a vapor pressure. That's all. That's the heading. So you should know that what are the basic qualitative properties. This is also a very commonly asked question in the Henderson Hazard equation, the, P, the pH is equals to pK, something log, log to what is that oh, equation is a Henderson, uh, Henderson uh, Hazard Bell's equation. Okay. Do I have questions? Do you want to say something? Anyone want to say something? I can hear something. All right. <clears throat> All right. Next is uh, rate of order of reaction. You should be aware of the uh, what are the different factors which uh, increases the rate of reaction? For example, this is a common question. So temperature, uh, addition of a solute, this will changes the uh, rate of the order of the reaction. So it's also also mentioned uh, in various, uh, in, 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 in the pharmaceutical studies. Similarly, the standing and emulsifying agent. As I told you, should know the names of the standing and emulsifying agents. Uh, acacia, fagagin, uh, carboxymethyl cellulose. These are all the emulsifying agents and standing agents. What is the charge on them? This is a very commonly asked question. So you should know the charge on these emulsifying agents. Oil and water and water and oil emulsion. So there, uh, uh, actually, how we convert from the oil and water to water and oil emulsion. You know that that uh, process of an HLB value, right? So you should know that oil and water and water and oil emulsion and their bases as well as we have discussed previously. Similarly, suppose it could basis. Extremely, extremely important question. They ask about the melting temperature of the supposedly basis. So just write it down. Melting temperature of the basis is very commonly asked question. Uh, disintegration and resolution testing. So I think they have asked this question uh, many times about the disintegration. So we should know, you should know the difference between disintegration and dissolution. Uh, and the entire coated and the film coated tablet, as I told, we should know the basic difference between the entire coating and film coating and what is the purpose of but why we use the direct coated and why we use the uh, film coated tablets. All right, so this is very commonly asked question. Like that. Now, next is the pharmaceutical chemistry. Uh, pharmaceutical chemistry, structures of the important drugs. So, structures of the, all the pro drugs, every class, for example, structure of a penicillin, amoxicillin, structure of a sulfonamide, sulfonamide, structure of a um, uh, Prednisone and prednisolone. It's a very, very commonly asked question. Structure of an estrogen, um, uh, structure of a beta lactam ring. They usually ask if the following is a beta lactam ring. Uh, so you, these are the very commonly asked questions, the very commonly prescribed medications. Okay. Um, all right, guys, if uh, the session drops, we have to uh, join the meeting again because that will last around 40 minutes. We have to join the meeting again. Right? Okay. So the next part is an SAR. Um, SAR consists of effect of a different functional groups on a molecule. So what is the effect of a methyl group, amino group, nitrogen group? These are the basic things that you need to cover. Because if we go, if you want to go into a detail into a medicinal chemistry, that would take ages. That would take ages to memorize or understand the whole basic concept of medicinal chemistry. But the thing is, you have to do it smartly here to uh, pass the uh, exam, right? So that's it from here. CDO chemistry. In enantiomers, what are the mirror images? What are the cis trans isomers? All of these things, especially stereo chemistry, this is a very, very commonly asked topic in the exam. You should focus more on the stereo chemistry, effect of function groups, and the structure of the important drugs. You can't memorize the, all the structure, but you should uh, familiarize uh, with them by looking at them, making a photo, trying to make a photo memory of them so that you can uh, mean, uh, give the right, nearly right answer in the exam. Um, all right, so basically now here comes the more important part from a quality and therapy. We have covered pharmaceutics, we have covered the chemistry. Those are the topics which you need to cover. Now, from the pharmacology and therapeutics, which makes 70% of your whole preparation and uh, it should be your priority in the last 10 to 15 days. You should cover all of these topics I'm going to tell you right from all of these 10 chapters. Uh, over the counter drugs, CVS, TNS, anti infective respiratory system, thyroid, diabetic, anti cancer, GIT, and arthritis. So, uh, because I'm working as a pharmacist, I know that 
what is the commonly prescribed medication what are the commonly prescribed or, or commonly asked otc medication that's why these are the questions which they usually ask in the exam so that uh, they make sure that once you start your internship you should have a basic knowledge of practice in care in australia so that's why i'm just uh, adding these topics uh, so from the otc it makes up cpr if you have a cpr 1925 will cover these things these are the very commonly asked topics which i have summarized here a chef life of the eye drops you should know that 28 days name of the sun blocking agent very commonly asked question treatment of acne first line treatment if someone comes in the pharmacy ask about the first line treatment of the acne you should know the answer that's a 10% benzoyl peroxide everyone knows that very commonly asked question don't mix up with the benzoyl and benzoyl there is a difference uh, dandruff very very uh, uh, top important topic for the examiners dermatitis so usually for dermatitis for pk we give hydrocortisone for a corticosteroid uh, amoxicillin in the dental surgery that's not an otc but uh, it comes in the otc sometimes uh, so amoxicillin you should know that prescribed by the dental people dental dental surgeons avoid any kind of infection because of the instruments that is fungal infections uh, vaginal thrush uh, oral thrush so we have to treat with the fungal things so clotrimazole uh, fluconazole uh, these are the commonly uh, uh, asked otc medications uh, from the otc sleeping pills right prestavit or you can say doxylamine is a very commonly uh, asked otc medication in the exam so you should know that what are the different sleeping pills and what are their roles dapsone Dapsone is used in leprosy. Straightforward question that always comes in exam. Paracetamol, doses of paracetamol in children, specifically in children, because this is the only medication which you can use in children uh, in one month of year. From one month to one year, there is no other medication you can use except paracetamol. So uh, that's why they usually ask the child dose from from paracetamol. Same goes with ibuprofen. You should know. The analgesic dose of ibuprofen. You should know the anti-rheumatic dose of ibuprofen. You should know the anti-inflammatory dose of ibuprofen. So very important medication, commonly asked in exam as well. A decongestants in Australia because of our environment here, because of our um, uh, hay fever season, and because of all of these uh, pollens here, decongestants are very very commonly asked uh, by person in exam. So that's why a uh, pseudoephedrine, phenylephrine. Uh, and these are the phenylephrine, sulfonylephrine, and uh, uh, oxymetazoline. These are the commonly decongestants which you really ask in exam. You should concentrate on uh, on these questions. That uh, those also do have to bring very important by the way. Medications for productive and non-productive cough. Uh, while you are reading the chapter 19 to 25, you can see productive cough is with the phlegm, and the non-productive is without phlegm. So, what are the medications which you can use? So. There's only one medication available, one or two, which can be used for the productive cough, and that's for uh, that's medication name is uh, guaifenesine, which comes in a brand of Biosilvan. People who are living in Australia at the moment they know that. So guaifenesine is very very commonly asked, uh, commonly uh, OTC medication for the productive cough. Similarly, amolian laxatives and the saline laxatives. They ask the name of the laxative. They will give you a name. And they will ask name, which, which uh, uh, give us the name, a class name of this uh, laxative, magnesium sulfate or magnesium citrate or or what? What is the type of amolian laxative? Just write it down. Uh, names of the amolian and saline laxatives. Very common here. And then the antacids. You should know that antacids, PPIs, H2 receptor antagonists. Uh, you know that uh, PPIs and H2 receptor antagonists and antacids. They're all prescribed medications. As well as these are the S2 medications as well. S2 medication means which uh, which go over the counter. Which you need and it's very very important. We will cover this in the next slide. Then over the counter emergency contraception. There are lots of legislation written in Australia for emergency contraception. You should know that this is the more medication is used for the emergency contraception. Then uh, herbal product. Ginkgo biloba is a favorite medication of the CAPS examiners. Asian ginseng, Saint John's Wort. These three are the most commonly asked herbal medication in the exam. Especially, especially ginkgo biloba and Saint John's Wort. Especially the interaction of Saint John's Wort with the uh, uh, warfarin. Uh, 
right? So just uh, try to write it down. So then talk about with uh, interaction with Barbarine and um, the use. Uh, yeah. So about the ginkgo biloba, they ask about the side effects uh, uh, of ginkgo biloba. So it causes uh, stomach cramps actually. So they usually ask this question in, uh, in there. Anyone have any questions? Anyone? Everyone is awake. Is everyone check? Everyone is awake, so everyone is here. So I can't see yeah. many people here um, with videos on. Just send send a message if you can. So. Hello, Asad. How are you? Hi, good, good. Rabi, how are you? Hello. I'm fine, thank you. I'm here. here. Rabi is here. Okay, Asad, okay. I want to ask uh, a question. Like last time when I gave the exam, there were many questions from Theophylline. Yeah, so, uh, I'm going to discuss Theophylline in the next uh, in the next slide. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'll discuss. Yes, everyone can uh, listen to me clearly because uh, one, of the com uh, one of the message saying that your voice is not clear. Is it clear or not clear? It's audible, sir. Yeah, it's audible. Okay. For me, it's very clear. Clear. All good. All good. So my uh, network problem is here. Okay, we move on. All right, next is a CVS. Okay, so that was the OTC portion. So I have summarized the OTC portion to school those topics uh, at the last minute study so that you can uh, cover the basic uh, theme in the exam. CVS. CVS makes uh, the backbone of the exam. Uh, so these are the basic topics which you need to cover. If you want me to summarize, I can do that for you. Uh, hypertension. Uh, hypertension includes diuretic. So you start with the thyroid diuretic, you start with the uh, low diuretics, all right. So you, these are the basic treatment plans for the uh, for the CVS. Then beta blockers. Uh, beta blocker includes all the adenolol, carbidolol. All the loads are in the beta blockers. Uh, the most commonly um, uh, common side effect of beta blockers is fatigue. You know, because fatigue very very commonly asked uh, in exam as well. It's common in in Australia. In Australia, in people in Australia as well. Uh, because of a manufacturing reason or something like that, I'm not sure, but this is very common. So it causes fatigue. So it is contraindicated in asthma, very common. So you can't give beta blockers. It is not safe to give beta blockers in asthma. The reason is uh, beta blockers basically uh, they are the, the non-selective beta blockers. They block the beta one on the heart and beta two on the lungs. If once they block the receptors, uh, the People with the history of asthma, they might die, right? So this is a very common interaction, commonly asked interaction in the exam. One more question, very, very commonly asked is the interaction between the beta blocker and hypoglycemia. So it says that beta blockers mask the hypoglycemic symptoms. So very, very commonly asked question in the exam. So um, expect this question in the exam again. So next is ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors, all the frills. This is not uh, on what else? Uh, Remipril, Brendopril. These are all the ACE inhibitors. Most two common side effects of the pills are or the ACE inhibitors are number one, trica, number two, uh, edema in ankles, right, on the body, and geodema, we can say. These are the two, two very common, uh, common uh, side effects of uh, this medication. Always ask this question. They can ask this question in the form of a question profile. They will give you a whole page question and they'll give you a, uh, giving you a question like a uh, patient came up uh, in the pharmacy. He's saying that he just started his medication and uh, his body swells up and all these. So you should know that if there is a beta blocker in the prescription in the history of the patient, that is the cause of the, uh, the swelling, that is the cause of a dry cup. Okay, so you will recommend the doctor to change the medication. So, on the answers given. Very, very important. Uh, beta, uh, this is from the ACE inhibitors. Yeah. Another question they usually ask from the ACE inhibitors is they ask the frequency of the dose. Uh, for example, lisinopril is once a day. Uh, or Coversil is once a day. 
the uh, what's your parenteral is once a day and which one is twice a day so once a day medication is a compliant medication so if the patient come he said i can't take uh, one tablet in the morning and one tablet at night so it means that patient is a non compliant he is not happy to take tablet two times in a day so you have to give him a compliant medication so compliant medication to a non compliant patient the compliant medication would be the medication which is having a one day to one daily dose right that would be a compliant medication so we have to check uh, from the as inhibitor which is a compliant medication arbs yeah so uh, from the mechanism of action they usually ask questions from the as inhibitors and arbs uh, they ask which of the following medication acts on the loop of hemlich which of the following medication acts on the angiotensin converting enzyme so the point of action uh, of the as inhibitors and arbs is very important calcium channel blockers uh brapamil causes constipation is very very important calcium channel blockers cannot are, are not, we don't use calcium channel blockers in heart failure simple straight forward question calcium channel blockers the dose of amlodipine the dose of uh, uh, what else what else medication in the calcium channel blockers we have brapamil dose of brapamil adverse effect very very common nifedipine uh, common yeah. yes by the way nifedipine is contraindicated with uh, a beta blockers let's write it down straight forward question nifedipine and beta blockers both changes the uh, conduction potential of the heart so that's why we we don't use it together then digoxin last time or in the previous exams in the last three or four years exam they usually ask questions about from the digoxin about its toxicity about the treatment of the digoxin about the a uh, bioavailability of the digoxin tablet and bioavailability of the digoxin capsules so remember that the bioavailability of the digoxin capsules is much much higher than the bioavailability of the digoxin tablet the reason is tablet has to disintegrate on the other hand capsules don't need waste time don't waste time to do an integration that will directly dissolve and the whole drug will be available in the body uh, in, a, in a smaller period Right, so that's a very common uh, question. Amiodarone is another medication. They have asked questions for amiodarone, antiarrhythmic. You should know its dose, its uh, precautions. Right, so it causes the most common side effect of amiodarone is it causes the corneal deposits in your eye. It changes the vision. Okay, so that's a very common uh, question. Lidocaine is dose. Lidocaine's uh, uh, loading dose. Lidocaine adverse effects. Everything from lidocaine. Very favorite drug of examiners. Dopamine and dibutamine used in a cardiogenic shock. Easiest question, straightforward question. It's a one-liner question. You are not going to spend more than a second in answering this question. We should know that. Potassium sparing diuretic. Okay. There are two questions on this topic. Potassium sparing diuretic. Number one. Which of the following is a potassium sparing diuretic which have a uh, aldosterone antagonist as well? So the name of the medications are spironolactone and aflirazine. These are the two potassium sparing diuretic which also acts as an aldosterone antagonist. Very commonly asked question. And dose of amiloride, dose of spironolactone is, is is very important. Then aspirin and clopidogrel. These are used as the blood thinners. Aspirin dose is 75 milligram to 162 milligram as an antiplatelet. Remember that the dose of aspirin uh, for the purpose of uh, pain is different, uh, <clears throat> and the dose of aspirin um, uh, in as an antiplatelet agent is different. So uh, keep in mind. And the dose of clopidogrel is straight 75 milligrams, and the clopidogrel is uh, contraindicated with proton pump inhibitors. Simple, simple question. We ask again uh, all the same questions. Last but not the least, statins. Excuse me. Yep. So, what did you say? Uh, dose of clopidogrel is contraindicated with. Uh, clopidogrel is contraindicated with proton pump inhibitors. Okay. Okay. Thick done. Okay. All right. So then statins. Okay. Statins. Atorvastatin. Lovastatin. Simvastatin. Very very commonly asked question. They ask about uh, the adverse effects of statins. Statins cause headache. Very common. Statins cause. Uh, um, 
a bit of nausea as well, vomiting as well, right? Uh, but they don't cause dizziness, except I think one or two. But yeah, this is a very common. Yeah, just look at the adverse effect of statin. They ask the adverse effect. They cause myoplegia. Ah, uh, myoplegia. Yep. Okay. I'm not sure about it, but yeah, you're right. Okay. Ah, uh, statins. Ah, uh, these are the things you should remember from a statin. Those of atorvastatin, lovastatin, simvastatin. Ah, uh, okay. I th I remember there was one question in exam. They asked about what is the good time of taking statins. Okay, uh, few statins doctor prescribe in the morning, few in the evening. Just remember that uh, Australian medicine handbook and the guidelines to a practitioner is that statins could be taken in the morning and evening. Uh, doesn't matter. Preferably, uh, statins should be taken in the evening. Evening right? time. Yeah. Right. So yeah, they can they can ask this question in the exam. These are the, all the topics. Ex, ex, excuse me, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question. We said uh, simvastatin can be taken at six p.m. and the other one was at in the evening. So between the two, which one would you choose? No, so simvastatin in the evening, and other one is mm. six p.m. Yeah. Yes, that other one was six p.m. and that other one was in the evening. Yeah, and yes, okay. I, I, I'm saying that simvastatin uh, and there is other medication. They can, they should, they are preferable to give in the evening, okay. right? So other statins uh, they could be in the evening or they could be in the morning. So it doesn't matter. But to be, uh, to be honest, uh, they prefer to give all the statins, especially simvastatin, in the evening because uh, there is two different. Uh, uh, Reasons behind it. Number one is uh, uh, I knew that this uh, doctor prescribed the statins in the evening. The reason being, at night your body goes to sleep and body changes itself, its physiological system. So statin works very well in the evening uh, once you sleep, right? Because it starts working after four hours or six, five hours. So it's uh, onset of action is after five or six hours. Once you go to the bed, once you go to the bed, your body changes itself, changes its physiological things and everything. So statin works properly at that time. That's why the research says that single statin should be taken in the evening. All right, so all the statins, but preferably single statin, uh, they should be given in the evening. All right. Thank you. All right. Next is the CNS, uh, the most difficult part of the uh, pharmacology and therapeutic portion. Um, so, chapter number 37 to 40 of the CPR comes to cover everything uh, from the CV, uh, CNS. But these are the most commonly asked questions from these topics which I have, covered, which I have written here. Phenytoin, right? They love phenytoin. I don't know why. They love the dose of carbamazepine and lamotrigine. Now, uh, the, the interaction, or you can say the adverse effect of carbamazepine and lamotrigine is rash. They cause rash. Very commonly asked questions. Dose of lamotrigine, the dose of, dose of carbamazepine, and dopamine. Mao inhibitors, you know that Mao inhibitors are contraindicated with tyramine containing food. But so you should know that which type of food contain tyramine in it. Right? So I, I remember that in 2017 or I think in 18, uh, we asked question about this, this thing, and patient comes in and he said, I just had a, had a cheese omelet. And I got this type of reaction. So what should I do? I'm taking PCA and all that. So uh, cheese, uh, fermented, fermented, uh, fermented cheese, or uh, basically contains uh, uh, containing tyramine. Yeah. So that's a contraindicated with the Mao inhibitor. You should be aware of that. Classification of Mao inhibitors. Uh, so you should know that SSRIs, the most commonly prescribed, the most commonly used, and the most effective SSRI, uh, uh, the most effective CNS medications are SSRI. If you come up question in the exam and you, and you know that uh, all of the four options contain the four different CNS medications and one of them is SSRI and you say you want to go and hit and trial method, always click SSRI. Because SSRI is used for multiple reasons. They cover like most of the, most of the indications, right? So SSRI includes, you know, that sertraline, uh, deloxity, uh, these, are, uh, these are the basic, uh, you know, SSRI. So these are used in the post-traumatic stress disorder. They are used in uh, depression. They are used in, in, in several other 
they are used in even um, uh, in pregnant women with depression you know uh, in the last trimester so this is these are the things we should be aware of that ssris it they can fit everywhere if you don't know the answer always check the ssri tcas tricyclic antidepressant i remember uh, last time they asked a question and one of my students told me that they asked about the amitriptyline you know that amitriptyline is a is a um, Tricyclic, uh, uh, yeah. tricyclic antidepressant, and they ask which for the following is an indication of uh, amitriptyline. So they have mentioned there migraine, right? Yeah. Uh, so you know should know that amitriptyline is used in migraine as well. Amitriptyline is also used in uh, neuropathic pain, the pain in the limbs, in the mm. hands. They are used in that purpose. So once we uh, that in our mind is always like it's an antidepressant so it should be used for depression not like that if the patient is having a history of depression as well as he's having a pain in the body or have a migraine attack because of a depression then we will prescribe this is that's indication you will get all of these information from the amh but uh, but that takes too much time for you to read the amh uh, from the gap and it's a waste of time anyways now the last thing apropion very commonly asked question about this medication and bupropion is used is the medication which is an antidepressant as well as it is used in a smoking cessation right mm -hmm. uh, so bupropion is very common uh, common prescribed as well so commonly asked question because it's the only antidepressant which is used uh, in in a smoking cessation in depression next is the respiratory system pretty much simple chapter um uh, many of the students i don't know why they face problems in this chapter um uh, uh, there are two questions they usually ask from this chapter um uh, pulmonary function test uh, residual volume you should know aware of that you should uh, watch a youtube video for that you should be aware of that how you diagnose uh, asthma uh, by looking at the residual volume what happened to the volume of the lungs if you have to diagnose asthma what happened to the forced expiratory volume it will increase or decrease so it's very common we ask questions so don't forget to read these things uh, you can uh, just google it or just uh, youtube it beta agonist short acting short acting is used when asthma attack is severe patient is there was uh, jogging or walking was fast uh, is was playing something got an attack you will give a short acting beta agonist straight forward always you have to start the therapy with short acting beta agonist right you will give him um, an asthma spray salbutamol or something like that that's salbutamol right so that's a, but if the patient is using that short acting beta beta agonist for two to more than two times a week for example if he intend to use more than two times a week then it means he is a proper asthmatic patient so then at that stage doctor adds long acting beta agonist right that's a category number one first line of agent is a short acting beta agonist a doctor give him okay once you required use it in the next meeting with the doctor if that patient told the doctor yeah hey, doctor i have used this one uh, more than two times a week and it's regular for four months four weeks then a doctor will give him a short acting as well as long acting so he will use two things together if still he has to use the short acting or the salbutamol then the doctor adds up a corticosteroid so he has to use the corticosteroid or a preventer for ever for a longer period of time and he don't he need to use uh, any kind of short acting or long acting acting beta agonist but if he is taking an corticosteroid and if he still goes uh, he needs to use the short acting beta agonist for uh, for the asthma attack then doctor will reassess his condition and give him higher doses of the corticosteroid now the category is number 1 short acting beta agonist long acting beta agonist addition of a corticosteroid increasing the dose of a corticosteroid simple is that there is no other formula there is no other treatment plan for that short acting long acting corticosteroid that's all simple theophylline uh, rabia mentioned about the theophylline so theophylline they usually ask about the theophylline its dose and its interaction with t its interaction with smoking Theophylline is the medication. If the patient is going to start theophylline, you should always ask the patient that are you going to start smoke or are you going to skip smoking? Because smoking will affect the way theophylline works. That's a very, very 
common thing about this presentation. Right? So it's a basically a visualizer. You should read about it. These are the common things, unique things about this presentation. So interaction with T, interaction with uh, what I say, um, uh, what's that? Commonly interaction with T as well as theophylline is contraindicated. Uh, yeah, with the smoke. Xanthine compound. Sorry? Xanthine compounds. Yeah, xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase. Yeah. Xanthine yeah. compound. Yes, exactly. Just give it a good read about the theophylline. Uh, okay. Arthritis. Three important questions. The whole chapter will finish. First line of treatment of osteoarthritis. The people who are living in Australia, they don't have, they, they have heard about panadol osteo, right? <clears throat> the panadol osteo is the commonly prescribed, a panadol uh, is a commonly prescribed first line treatment for the osteoarthritis. One question. Second one, methotrexate. Methotrexate, we use uh, methotrexate uh, in arthritis. There are two questions about the methotrexate which they always ask in the exam and these questions are, are in their exam old questions as well. Number one, the dosage of the methotrexate. Number one, the dosage of methotrexate. Its dose is, you know that, uh, 10 Seven. to 15 to 25 milligrams. 15 mg. 15 mg. Per week. Weekly. Yeah, it's a weekly dose. Not, yeah. uh, uh, it's not monthly or it's not daily dose, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, methotrexate, uh, it's a uh, basic, it's mechanism of action is it's a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor. It causes a deficiency of, it causes a deficiency of folic acid. So the patient folic acid supplementation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's necessary with this medication. So it's, these are the very yes. common medications. Then DMARTs, uh, disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. Mm -hmm. The written exam uh, for the intern pharmacy, the written exam, they have, uh, they included question about the demand as well. It's very important for you. So you should know the classification of demand. And then the immunosuppressants. There are two commonly prescribed immunosuppressants in Australia. Forget about all of them. Number one is azathioprine. Number two is cyclosporine. That's all. So just uh, read about these two things and your extra chapter will be covered. Right? These are the Last. Hello. Can, you, can you repeat the names, please? Yeah, so it's uh, and cyclosporine. We, we need to learn details about all both the drugs. Yep. Okay. okay. So, Caroline, uh, what do you want me to repeat? I asked uh, about repeating the immunosuppressant's names. Yeah, okay. So, uh, cyclosporine and is a <clears throat> Okay. Okay. All good. Uh, next is hyperuricemia. Okay. So, hyperuricemia, there are five things you should remember. Number one, uh, treatment during the attack. Number two, treatment after the attack. Number three, colchicine, colchicine allopurinol, and probenicin. Five things and your chapter is covered. During the attack, once the patient is having an attack going on, right, you will not give any medication which will help to reduce the uric acid level. You will give the medication to treat the pain only. You will treat the symptoms only. That's all. You will give endomethacin. You can give colchicine is the commonly prescribed anti-inflammatory medication during the attack. Once the attack finishes, then you will give allopurinol or probenicin. Okay, so the treatment during the attack would be anti-inflammatory or analgesic for the pain. But once the attack will finish, then you will use colchicine. Colchicine, uh, sorry, once you, then you use allopurinol and probenicin. Easy as, as it is. And the, uh, the unique thing about the probenicin is it's the only uricosuric drug. Uricosuric means it increases the excretion of the uric acid from the body. So uh, you should know uh, these things from this whole chapter. That's all. Very important. So if I'm saying allopurinol and propensity, you should know the adverse effects and the interactions as well. GIT, three things, chapter cover. Antacids, PPIs, H2 receptor antagonists. Now, H2 receptor antagonists is, is 
this would be very unlikely if they ask a question from H2 receptor antagonist because uh, uh, H2 receptor antagonists are not available in Australia at the moment. They are not available at all because of their adverse effects. Um, um, so uh, antacids and uh, protons and inhibitors, they can ask questions from this. You should know each and everything about these three topics. Antacids, EPI especially, their onset of action, their duration of action, um, and from the PPI, you should know that uh, miprazole or tesomiprazole could be dissolved in water, could be crushed or not, could be taken with food, without food, prior to food, empty stomach, or with food. Very important questions. All right. So usually we give PPIs on an empty stomach, and we give antacids between the two meals. All right. So after two to three hours after the food, or you can say two to three hours before the food. On an yeah, so between the meals, I to say that. Antacid should be given between the meals, and uh, PPI should be given on an empty stomach, especially in the morning, so just before two, 30 minutes before. Because now that's the chemistry, the question from the chemistry. So why PPI should be used on an empty stomach? Because PPI contains a sulfhydryl group. Sulfhydryl group is SH group. That SH group needs an acidic environment to work uh, to work and to uh, neutralize the acid. So that's why this is a very uh, uh, commonly asked question as well in the exam. So acidic environment uh, will need an acid group will need an acidic environment to neutralize the acid. Right? And the doses of ranitidine, anisotidine, uh, 150 milligrams, or something like that. Hello? Uh, yep. Yeah, could you repeat about the um, antacid? So the time of the yeah, so between the when to take it between, between the, the meals. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No worries. Next is the anti cancer. So classification of the anti cancer medication is pretty much important, uh, and the dosing depends on what factors. Uh, this is a this is a question. It's already in their pool. Uh, so. Dosing uh, of the anti cancer depend on the age, for example, on the uh, surface area of the body, on the weight of the body. So you should know that. Oh, Once you read yeah. the anti cancer, it, it's written there. Now, uh, about the side effects, alopecia, the common side effect of the anti cancers, and uh, yeah, so methotrexate is also an anti cancer, works as an anti cancer, and all these kind of medications. Uh, yeah, so usually they don't ask many questions from anti cancer, but I have uh, uh, I have uh, heard many students saying that uh, we have got a lot of questions from the anti cancer, especially from a, from a uh, classification point of view or especially from the uh, you can say side effects point of view. So, uh, to be honest, there is no dosing of the anti cancer you can memorize, there is no proper uh, mechanism of action known, so that's why there is no point of wasting time on doing these. So, if you with the rest of the things that told you. So if you ignore these things, that will be pretty much you'll be alright. Um, last few slides actually. So last one is an S. And second last is an anti-infectives. Okay. Anti-infectives, you should know the antibacterials, tetracyclines. You know, you know that tetracyclines causes uh, tooth discoloration uh, in children. And the, the people who are in Australia, I don't know they have noticed this or not. In, in 1950s or 60s, the generation of that time uh, who were very young uh, in 1950s or 60s, uh, now they're very old, obviously. So you, if you see their teeth, they're very yellowish in color, very blackish and yellow it's stained. It is because at that time, uh, uh, the mothers, uh, while breastfeeding them, they usually take tetracycline and that causes a tooth dispersion in the infant. So uh, if you find any Australian with a black stained teeth, so obviously, because of 80% uh, because of that reason. So, um, all right, so this is a very commonly asked uh, if, 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 yeah, one question. This is always confusing, and it's people, many people uh, give a wrong answer to this question. Doxycycline was supposed to be contraindicated with dairy products. Doxycycline. Before, as a whole, tetracyclines have an interaction with milk. But dox, uh, doxycycline now, it has no interaction with milk. So you can give tetra a doxycycline with milk. That's completely all right. But other than doxycycline, 
we have to be uh, pretty much careful with the okay but doxycycline is an exception here uh doxycycline is having interaction with iron right uh yes yeah. all right next is uh, yeah doxycycline is also used in acne important point uh it's the first line of treatment in acne uh and yes uh, i remember, remember one other question in exam doxycycline is used in acne if the patient comes uh comes to you and the patient is taking isotretinoin isotretinoin is a medication used in acne as well so isotretinoin and doxycycline both of these medications are used in acne but both of them are contraindicated they can't be used together just keep in mind now then penicillins obviously amoxicillin you should know the structure of the amoxicillin we should know the dose of amoxicillin we should know uh the different uses of amoxicillin amoxicillin is used for many many things right uh for the surgical in the dental infections or amoxicillin could be used abdominal infection for the uh intra abdominal infections or these are called chronic infections you can use the amoxicillin so you should know uh these things the saponamides similarly macrolides sulfosporins these are the common the ask question from these things especially from the saponamides and sulfosporins all right the structures as well so sulfosporins saponamides and penicillins have a pretty much similar structure uh, in one way or the other try to memorize the difference between them yes about sulfonamides people who are allergic to sulfur who are allergic to sulfur or people who are allergic to aspirin they must be allergic to sulfonamides as well because the all of these things contain sulfur in it so the compounds containing sulfur you should know that which compound contains what antifungals as i discussed earlier clotrimazole fluconazole for the vaginal infection uh nystatin used for the oral uh, oral thrush so vaginal thrush clotrimazole and fluconazole for the oral thrush um uh, you know that thrush is a is a bacterial infection uh, fungal infection so the oral thrush preferably we use um uh, clotrimazole and nystatin remember that antivirals hello can you please repeat this point yeah so antifungals are uh, basically uh clotrimazole and fluconazole are used in a fungal infection or fungal uh, uh fungal infection means vaginal thrush and statin and clotrimazole uh, are used preferably are used in uh, oral thrush especially in statin Next is antivirals. So, antivirals contain the acyclovir and valacyclovir. Um, yeah. So, just do everything from these medications. You should know that the doses are 500 milligrams for the acyclovir and valacyclovir. And what are their adverse effects? Just give it a good read about these medications. And last one is the thyroids. Uh, simple levothyroxin uh, you know that it comes in uh, three dosage forms 50 mcg uh, 100 mcg uh, mcg not milligrams okay it's a microgram it's dose in micrograms uh, should not get confused in exam so there is there are only three doses available in the whole world 50 mcg 100 mcg and 150 mcg sorry uh, uh, 50 mcg 75 mcg and 100 mcg 50 yeah, 75 and 100 that's yeah, i think comes into 100 uh yes yeah, comes to 200 yes in australia yes it comes into 100 50 75 100 and 200 exactly you're right yes, okay okay hello so, yep hi so just 50 75 then 50, 150 uh 50 75 100 and 200 so the range would be okay. from 50 to 200 yes okay thank you yes. and the 
other of the two medications are methimazole and propylthiazole. Just three medications, and your thyroid chapter is uh, pretty much done. All right, last three slides. Drugs you must see in exam. These are all the medications which you will definitely be uh, uh, expecting in the exam. Okay, atropine. Yes, dose of atropine. 0.4 to 0.2 to 0.4 to 2 milligrams. 0.3 to 0.2 is difference, uh, but maximum dose is 2 milligrams. Okay? Doxycycline, warfarin. Now, warfarin and INR of warfarin. So the changes in the INR, which is an international normalized ratio. Once any medication, it changes the INR, it changes the clotting time of the blood. All right? Any medication, it changes the INR, it changes the clotting time of the blood. So, any medication who is affecting the INR, that question is extremely important. It could be aspirin, it could be phenytoin, it could be uh, St. John's Ward, it could be Asian ginseng, it could be anything. It could be any medication while you are going through your uh, resources. If you find out these things, just spot on and just do that properly because this will be ask an exam about the INR. INR is an internationalized normalized ratio which uh, determines the uh, plotting time, right? Hello. Yep. Sir, what is the exact relation between the warfarin and the St. John uh, syndrome interaction? Basically, St. John's ward, I think it decreases the INR of warfarin. So, INR of once the INR will be decreased, the plotting time will change. All right, so you will not give these yes. medications together. That means it will be uh, increasing the clotting time? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm not sure, but yeah, I think. Uh, because the effect, you can see that the changes in the INR it changes the way the clotting time uh, of the blood affects, you know. So I'm not sure it decreases the clotting time or increases the clotting time. John decreases. Right, it decreases the INR, but he's no, asking. Decrease. Decrease, yeah. Decrease the means clotting only. Said John. Decrease in INR, that means clotting, and increase in INR means bleeding time. Yeah, all good. All good. Yep, yes. hello. Hi. Yeah. Um, with a um, warfarin again, so there's another two drugs that can um, affect the INR, right? St. John's Word. What's the other two? Asian ginseng. Asian ginseng. Yeah. 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 I just give okay. you an example. I just give you an example. Uh, there are plenty of medications which affects the INR. So just uh, try to find out those medications as well. All right. Okay. Just give you Thanks. Two, give you an example. Then the phenytoin, yep. uh, the joxin, vancomas. I remember in 2019 there were three questions from vancomas in a single exam. Okay. So vancomycin is uh, there were basically uh, in the pool of the caps. Uh, uh, Gaps exam. There are, I think, four questions related to vancomycin. Number one, uh, its use. Number two, uh, it is used in a pseudomembranous colitis infection. Pseudomembranous colitis infection. Number three, I think it is not available orally. It is not absorbed orally. Uh, just confirm. Just correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, yeah, number right. four, yeah, thanks. And number four, vancomycin causes the ototoxicity, so hearing loss. And red man syndrome. Red man syndrome, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. different one. Yeah, yes. and that's I think one. it can be used in renal insufficiency. It was one of the questions. Yeah. Well. So, vancomycin, yeah, so just give it a good uh, time of reading. Then, methotrexate, I have discussed earlier, GIT drugs, H2 receptor antagonists, proton pump inhibitors. Diazepam, diazepam uh, as an um, uh, antiolytic, you know, the antiolytic calms down. It is used for the sleep purpose um, in a depress depressive patient or anxiety patient. Uh, dose of diazepam, uh, the, uh, it is used in a convulsive status epileptic. Very, very okay. common. Okay. Yes. Diazepam is used in a convulsive status epileptic. Uh, Then amoxicillin, ginkgo biloba, friends on board, hypertension medications, hematocrit value, the normal hematocrit value. Uh, it's I think 45%. I'm not sure. 
if someone can 40 to 50 percent to 50 exactly 40, 50, 50, yeah. yeah so just uh, don't forget that this, this is the physiological portion actually then diuretics uh, gout drugs methotrexate i again and the answers answers include ibuprofen naproxen um, these are the, all the answers now calculations uh, the bit technical part to be honest epic calculation book will cover the 80% of your calculations uh, then the chapter number 5 of the cpr only the formulas from that chapter now uh, most of you who are uh, or <clears throat> used to uh, study with me actually uh, i always uh, stress on the epic calculation book not on the cpr chapter 5 the reason behind that uh, that point is that in exam you will be having very very consistent time you will be not having much time on doing the long questions or the difficult ones to be honest uh, you will see on the on, on in december once you are attempting the exam the idea is if you are getting 10 uh, 10 calculations out of 10 calculations you should do five or six super quickly super quick you should be efficient in doing those five or six calculations in no time only that way you will be able to finish your exam in time, right? If you will spend too much time on doing uh, steady state or the imperial drops or those kind of lengthy uh, questions, you will not be able to complete your exam and you will end up uh, uh, in the wrong answer of those questions which you can give the right answer. Just because, because of a short of time or just panicking in the last minute. So doing the epic calculation book, 14 chapters, you will be able to uh, pretty much so you will be able to pass the calculation portion. So what are those things? Dilutions, simple dilutions. If we put uh, one, uh, if we put uh, 5 ml of water in a 6 ml of milk, how? Uh, what, what is the concentration of that? If we put 10% uh, weight by volume of a solution into a 20%, what would be the uh, concentration of a final one? So that's a simple dilutions. Milli equivalent and milli osmols, uh, you should know that. I have uh, discussed these ones with my students. If Yes, milli equivalents. The milli equivalent, the trick is milli equivalents. You have to calculate the ions, number of ions. Uh, sorry, not uh, valency of the uh, valency of the ions. For example, H2O. The valency of hydrogen is what plus one. So in milli equivalents, one valency. Yes, to so milli equivalents, you have to focus on the number of valency. But in milli osmoles, you will see how many number of ions are being made after the breaking up of the molecule. Then pH, so calculation about the pH, super simple, super easy. In no time you can solve those questions. Uh, number of tablets, so number of tablet means patient comes in, uh, uh, the prescription comes to you and uh, uh, and doctor prescribe 500 milligram uh, for 10 days and you have got tablets of 250 milligram. Then how many tablets are you gonna dispense, right? So you will calculate, okay, if he's taking 500 milligram in 10 days, uh, so how many tablets you will need for a 250 milligram? So this is a very tricky and simple IQ type type questions. Uh, you should be able to answer. You can solve this question from that book as well. Then dose calculation: 25 milligram per kg per day for 10 days. What could be the total dose? Okay, simple, easy. You have to um, uh, just you have to uh, addition. Yeah, just multiply it with the weight and uh, per day and yes, that's all. There is nothing much. Unity method, a very, very uh, common method. I am pretty much sure if you more than 50% of your question in exam, you will be able to solve with a unity method. So, for example, if 10 milligrams in 5 ml, then how much in the 5 milligrams? So, you will be able to answer that. Right? And then C1V1 is equal to C2V2. If one solution have a initial concentration, initial volume, and the concentration of the second solution is given, what would be the volume of the second solution? Simple, C1V1 is equal to C2V2 formula. Infusion drops per minute or uh, trips drops per minute. I personally uh, would not like to answer this question in exam because these questions will take more than five to six minutes. So we have not have much time in doing these questions. But if you, uh, you should practice those questions yourself and see if you got time in the exam to spend more, more time. Then child and adult dose formulas, Young's rule, uh, child dose, adult surface area, all these kind of formulas, you should memorize them. 
uh, half life and shelf life half life is equals to 0.693 over k shelf life is equals to whatever loading dose um, uh, plasma concentration bioavailability these are all the formulas against these uh, question is in chapter number 5 of the cpl write down all the formula in a page try to uh, uh, incorporate those formula in the question given at the end of the chapter <laughs> Uh, and you will be able to answer the question. So these are the basic questions. Or you can even, you, if you can YouTube it about these questions, you will be able to understand the basic concept. So uh, do that, must do these ones. And percentage weight by volume and, and percentage weight by weight. If you, these are the very, these are the easiest questions. The percentage weight by volume means, for example, if I'm saying 10% weight by volume means 10 grams mm -hmm. in 100. If I'm saying percentage weight by weight is 10 grams in 100 grams, so it's super easy. So you won't be able to learn the problem. Last I'm two sorry slides. To interrupt. Yep. Excuse me. Sorry. Can you can you please repeat what is the uh, unity method? Yeah, unity method is, for example, if I'm saying, uh, uh, if you are earning, if someone is earning five thousand dollars in one month. $5,000 is one quantity and in one month. So how much he going to earn in 12 months? So you have got three values. You can end up uh, finding the fourth value. Understand? So if she is earning $5,000 in one month, so how much he will earn in 12 months? So 5,000 in one month and in 12 months. Uh, ah, okay. Okay. So then you will uh, cross multiply okay. and finding the answer. Thank you. Right. Yeah, so these are more than 50% of the questions could be solved with this method. This is a very important part of uh, time management. Look, um, the exam day would be a bit stressful, to be honest. You have to give two hours exam first and then two hours probably one hour break, I'm not sure, and then two hours exam again, right? They have two exams in one day. The idea is two hours means 120 minutes and you have got 100 questions. So technically, you will be having 80 seconds. 80 seconds for uh, one question. But if you spend 80 seconds on one question, you will not be able to answer every question in the exam. Because some questions will take 10 seconds and some questions might take two to three or four minutes even, right? Technique is, which usually I follow, is the 30 minute formula. Right, so what's the 30 minute formula? First of all, ideally, you shouldn't be spending more than 65 seconds. Obviously, you will not have any time to just uh, uh, look at your time for the 50, 65 seconds. So, what you need to do is apply the formula, which is 30 questions in 30 minutes. So, you have to target for every 30 minutes, look at the watch once you're starting the exam, and you should know that okay, after 30 minutes, I should have finished 30 questions. That would be the that would be the trick, right? So 30 questions in 30 minutes, uh, 30, 60, 90, and 120. Simple. You will be having a 15, 20 minutes extra at the end. Okay. So in 30 minutes, you have to solve 30 questions. Now, once you read read the question in your screen, and uh, if you're able to answer it straight away, then that's that's okay. Okay. Right? If you think you have spent more than one minute. Put anyone as an answer, flag the question and move on. Because if you try to answer that question correctly, right, you are wasting your time. You are wasting your time because might be the next question which will be coming up. You can answer it in one second time, in two second time. So you have to make sure you don't have to worry about the wrong ones. You have to worry about the fifty right ones. You have to target the fifty right answer. Out of hundred questions. Probably you will be able in a single go. You might be probably be able to give 40, 35 right answers straight away. Then in the last 15, 20 minutes from the uh, from the flat questions, uh, if you spend more time on them, probably you will be able to give more 15 right answers as well. So the key is don't spend much time on a question, uh, more than one minute or one and a half minute, not at all. If you do that, you will not be able to. Um, pass the exam. Number one, sometimes it happens. Your first question will be your recalculation question. Sometimes. My advice to you is don't try to solve the calculations first. Just flag them. Okay, just flag them.